in theoretical physics, you need to have an ability to come up with ideas. An ability to see the underlying structure of things. What you're really trying to do is you're looking at the world around you and you're trying to see what is the invisible framework that could hold all of this together. So there's a bit of a architectural knowledge, like the structural integrity of a building, but there's also the aesthetic beauty. I think Professor Salam had both of those things. I think theoretical physics needs both of those things. A famous scientist once said that there are two kinds of genius. The first kind produce results of such devastating logic and clarity. They leave you feeling, well, I could have done that too. The other group are what he called the magicians, whose sources of inspiration are altogether more enigmatic. And I think Salam belonged to this magic circle, if you like. There was always an air of Eastern mysticism about his ideas. My father was born in Jung City, and the house that he grew up in is still there. Very basic house, no electricity, no running water. He worked by candlelight. It's a very, very simple, basic life. The family knew from early on that my father was a particularly gifted child. After father had finished secondary school, he then went to government college in Lahore, up until he got his scholarship to come to Cambridge in 1946. Then he went back to Pakistan. But when he went back home, there was nothing there for him. No intellectual stimulation, no libraries, no books. That was when he made that decision to leave and come back to the UK. And that was a very, very hard decision for him to leave his family. The theoretical physics group was founded by Salam at Imperial College in 1957. And when he got the offer from Imperial, his bosses in Cambridge weren't very happy because they wanted to keep him there. So they made an attempt to do so, but he ignored them and came to Imperial. When he received the offer from Imperial to come and join them, he was absolutely delighted. It was a matter of great pride for him, and he felt instantly that this is where he wanted to be. This was one of the most exciting groups. We had so many young, talented people. There was this general feeling that the world really was open to us. Well, I remember the first day I met him, the head of the department told me to go along and knock on Salam's door, which I nervously did. And I remember, although it was a warm day, he had on a three-bar electric fire and a college scarf around his neck. And instead of allocating one topic for my PhD, he gave three. He had such a burgeoning of ideas. He was like a firework display. And of course, a byproduct of firework displays is a lot of smoke. And so you never quite knew what was, always what was going on, but he managed to create this sense of enthusiasm. In one case, I'd been working on something for several months and I got a little bit stuck. And I went to him and said, ah, you know, I'm." We're almost there. I'm almost there, I think. It's probably going to work. And he said, dear boy, we're not doing that at all. There's this marvellous paper by Gersi and Radicati, and that's where we're going to go. So we learned to uh, avoid him until we had something concrete. I've never come across anybody who made me think this is what I want to do. <laughs> if you have a creative mind, there is place for you in theoretical physics. I think that is the mark of a, of a truly great physicist, is that you give it all you have, but you're not holding on to something so tightly that you're not able to let go when you find out that it's not realized in nature. In many ways, he exemplified this and said it's a creative field. It's that attitude of, let's think about it, let's go for it. Perhaps it'll work and perhaps it won't and expect to be wrong. You cannot escape knowledge. Science is knowledge. Knowledge is knowledge whichever way it's acquired. It's part of our culture. This is the scientific age. You cannot escape it. 
No one in the East can, no one in the West can. This is the scientific age. Salam always said that his, um, his reason for studying unity and symmetry was based in a religious feeling. There is this emphasis in Islam on one single unity underlying all of creation. That was something that really drove Salam. Salam's Nobel Prize winning work was Electroweak Unification. This work was done at Imperial College in 1968. At the time, we thought there were four fundamental forces in nature. The strong and weak nuclear force, the electromagnetic force, and the gravitational force. Theorists are not happy with having four different explanations for the universe. We'd like an all-embracing equation that describes all the forces. And what Salam did, together with independently Weinberg and Glashow, was to unify two of those forces, the weak nuclear force, which is responsible for radioactivity, and the electromagnetic force, which is responsible for light, electricity, and magnetism. The difficulty in trying to unify these forces was, was huge. I mean, it just seemed apparently impossible, right? You have forces that are very long range, then you have this weak force, which is literally limited to the nucleus of an atom. You have particle carriers that are absolutely massless, and then you have some that are very, very heavy. So how could you possibly unify two things when one's heavy and the other's massless? That was the dilemma. And the answer turned out to be the Higgs boson. The Higgs boson was proposed by Peter Higgs in 64. And what Salam realized was that what Higgs had proposed was the answer to the problem of how to unify the two forces. So it was a huge step. In a nutshell, that's what it is. It, it, these two things which look completely diverse are actually the same force in different manifestations. So together with Weinberg and Glashow, Salam is responsible for the theory that we now believe explains the whole universe, up to the gravitational force, which is the next stage. But every experiment that's ever been performed is, is consistent with Salam's standard model of particle physics. Many years later, in 2012, I was lucky enough to be at CERN in the auditorium with only 200 people where they announced the discovery of the Higgs. As a layman, I would now say, I think we have it. And I had the same feeling. People were shouting and sometimes crying, and you know, it was very, 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 very exciting. Unfortunately, Salam was not there to, to enjoy it. The feeling that I had at that time is hard to describe. This is history for humankind forever. Going to Sweden and going to Stockholm in December was just the most memorable event possible. And he was told you'll wear tails in the traditional style. He said, but that's not my national dress. Can I wear my national costume? And the authorities were slightly taken aback, but they, of course, they agreed. And that was part of his charm. They couldn't say no to him. He wore his national dress as a badge of honor. It's almost iconic, that picture of him when he won the Nobel Prize. He was wearing a pagri, which was the traditional turban that was worn for important ceremonies. He wore the sherwani, which again was the national dress. And the khusas, the you know, the shoes with the turned up uh, edges. So very uh, regal, very formal. And what I really admire about him is that he never lost touch with his own identity. The first time that I left Pakistan, I had that sense of being cut off from everything I had known before then and cut off from home. That's when it struck me exactly how difficult it can be. I mean, how much more it would have been for him. It made me realize how important it is to have mentors who come from similar backgrounds. He is just a model that we can look to as a mentor and see how he navigated certain challenges and use them to figure out what we, what we ourselves should do. I feel that one of the reasons why the ICTP was so successful is because it was started by someone who had been through these experiences himself. He didn't want what happened to him to happen to others. 
and Salan proposed the creation of this center in Trieste, which is called ICTP, International Center for Theoretical Physics. The idea of this center is to support scientists from developing countries so that they don't have to leave their country or leave the field. The center was created not out of an intellectual need, but out of a humanitarian need to give the best students from the developing countries the opportunity to come somewhere for three or six months in the year where they can meet the best intellectuals in their particular field, they can be recharged, energized by that interaction, and then they can go back to their own countries and spread that knowledge further. He thought that people bring in their own unique perspectives, conditioned by their culture, conditioned by the way they grew up. And that's one of the reasons he thought that we need a diversity of physicists. We need people from all over the world. There was something going beyond any political differences. So we can have the scientists from Israel and from Palestine, or scientists from Pakistan and from India. It's impressive to see how science get them together. And when they see each other, they realize that they're all the same and they have the same values and the same interest for science. He had this great vision and then it applied to science, but also to community. And, and uh, so some people say that in the same way that he received a Nobel Prize for unifying the electromagnetic and weak interaction, he should, he should have received a Nobel Prize for unifying peoples of different cultures. So in that sense, it's hard to identify a figure that will have more impact in all science in all the world than Abdul Salam. Why we're still talking about him now, 27 years after his death, is because of that legacy of trying to break down the barriers between the developed world and the developing world. His Nobel work was a moment in time, it was awesome, but it was just a piece of work at the end of the day that would have been done by somebody. What would not have been done by somebody is his work on development of science and technology in the developing world. Being here at Imperial, where Abdus Salam would have walked these corridors and written on these blackboards, and where he did so much of his influential work, is a very exciting place to be. Western Western I do think for a lot of theoretical physicists, it is a dream to have a fundamental description which includes all of the fundamental forces and particles we see. You have this. You'll have a. There is something which will always be intriguing and mysterious about this theory that could describe everything. It will always be a question. It's always going to be up in the air and it's always going to be a driving force. So in that sense, there is no end to this uh, you know, journey of theoretical physics. What I would like to see in the future is not a goal which is so related to theoretical physics. It's more broad in the sense of science in general. I would like to see on countries around the world put more of a focus on developing the infrastructure and opportunities available to people in these countries and to young children and to teenagers. This is something that Salam actually was very conscious about because who knows what great minds are out there just waiting for the opportunity to arise. Mm -hmm.